fantastic documentary, What Killed Michael Brown, uh, by our friend uh, Shelby Steele, but produced by his son, Eli Steele. I want to play the next clip with well, a reenactment of the testimonies of witnesses, what they say they saw, what they claim to have seen, and this is a big deal because this resonated throughout the culture for some period of time before the truth ever caught up with it. So let's take a look at this. Go ahead. I see Mike Brown and his friend walking down the street closer to the curb, you know, not on the sidewalk. And my initial thought was, wow, you know, that is a big guy right there. 21, put me on Canfield, number two, and send me to our car. You know, I just seen Mike Brown inside the police officer's window, and it appeared as if some sort of confrontation was taking place. It looked like, it looked like you know, they was going at it, because I could see the young man, you know. I, I could see him hitting at the policeman, and, and, and the policeman, you know, as far as I could tell, was, he was going like, like this. And it looked like he was going for his gun. He backed away from the car, and he, um, he was standing there for a minute, and then he took off running. And my initial thought was that, wow, you know, did I just witness this young guy kill a police officer? The officer had got out of his truck and he had his gun down to his side like that. He had his gun drawn and it was down to his side. The police officer exited his vehicle with his weapon drawn, pursuing Mike Brown. He is running behind and, and, and yelling stop. And he did not fire at Michael while he was running away. I didn't see him fire. I didn't even hear gunshots until later. He just threw his hands up and he turned around and he kind of put his hands down. He was like shuffling. He was just shuffling back and forth. He looked like he was going to raise his hands at one point, but he didn't. I can't say for sure what sort of body gesture. I, I can't fully recall. All I know is it, it's not a motion of surrendering, putting my hands up or anything. Michael was shuffling back and forth like he was confused, and then he started running. Immediately after he did his body gesture, he came for force. You know, full charge of the officer. His hands were balled up. He had, um, he has his arms bent towards his chest, and he's running like, you know, almost like a tackle running. I heard him say, "Get down!" about two or three times. I probably would have, would have shot him instantly if you charged at me like that. But when he was running back, he was screaming, "Stop! Stop!" And the officer was backing up as he kept coming closer to him, and he didn't stop. I heard three shots. Well, I think it was three. I thought he was missing him because me thinking if you get shot, you know, you're going to go down. I don't know how many times he shot him, although all together, but like you seen one of the bullets hit him in his face because you seen like the splatter from it. Think about it. If you came out one of these doors and saw the body of Michael Brown, what would you think? Groups pass on their identity to their young by telling cautionary tales. Watch out for tails. For blacks, watch out for whites. So if you're black and you see Brown's body, there is already a framework of meaning in place. You don't think so much as step into that meaning. And at that moment, before any evidence or witness testimony, all you can see is a victim of American racism. So Shelby Steele, the, uh, the testimony we heard um, was deemed accurate by the Department of Justice. And when you listen to it, it does sound like just from that, that the officer was justified in acting, um, just based on what these witnesses were saying. And then you say something enormously profound, which is people have preconceived notions, preconceived racial notions which they project onto events. And as you're beginning to say here, people are projecting onto events. Can you expand on that a little bit for us? Well, in the case of Michael Brown, black teenager shot by a white cop, uh, almost instantly, literally instantly, um, it was ascribed to racism. Here it is again. I step out my door and racism is in the street in front of me. It's systemic. It's everywhere. Uh, this poor boy is a, is a, is a victim of a, a, hated, a hateful cop. 
that becomes like, again, what I call a poetic truth. And the poetic truth enters into a competition with what really happened. And behind th this little scene, the entire nation enters into a conversation over what really happened. Uh, in other words, is racism still so, so prolific in America that a teenage kid on a Saturday afternoon can be shot dead for being nothing more than black? Or is that not the case? Uh, did something entirely different from that happen? Um, well, as we show, and we try to march through the incident itself, the shooting, uh, the, 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 the uh, immediate reaction to that and, and so forth, that uh, very quickly, this poetic truth became the driving force that, that turned Ferguson into a huge national event. Um, so again, as we say in Chicago, when thousands time, times uh, the, the amount of violence and so forth, the, the trigger fingers in Chicago were always black. But in the Michael Brown incident, the trigger finger was white. Uh, and so it evoked all of, his, all of America's ugly racist past and it became a, um, it became a potential source of moral power for those, pe those people and ideologies who are invested uh, in, the, in the idea that America is a racist society. The American left, the, the essence of its power is in the idea of black victimization. And you know, we see this today times a hundred, times a thousand, don't we? We even see uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and when I see them rioting, uh, I see an awful lot of white kids in the Black Lives Matter movement, as a matter of fact. This is, this is sort of a vessel through which what you're talking about now, not them, just them, it's kind of been centralized and activated, has it not? Yes, it has. Um, that's a, 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 it interests me for, for a bunch of reasons, but, but yes, they, they, uh, this, every youth, every generation has to sort of go through its, its little rebellious phase. Well, for the current generation, this is it. Um, uh, and the, there is this desire to, to do what other generations have done, rebel and take on America and challenge America and so forth. And so th that youthful generation uses the Michael Brown event, again, to, uh, as it's, to justify its pursuit of power. It's, that's why we're out here in the street, because blacks today are, are uh, in our society are under threat from white supremacy and uh, systemic racism and, and uh, we're here to eradicate all that. Um, but there's one big problem, just for a quick aside, that's important. There's one big problem. There is, I speak as somebody who knows, I grew up in a totally segregated America. My side of the street was black, whites were on the other side of the street. 20 years passed, not a word exchanged. I know all about what real segregation is. When King demonstrated, boy, there was a, there were point, it was there was no no one doubted why everybody could see it. Today, where is the racism? What institutions are systemically discriminating against black people? Where are these places? Uh, they don't exist. We as black people are are, are free. The the oppression that once weighed us down. Uh, well, the freedom we won for ourselves now scares us because we don't have a lot of experience with freedom. So what do we do? We say, Michael Brown is a victim of racism. Racism is still here. I'm still fighting racism. No, you just are not yet taken on, recognized, accepted that the challenge you face now is not racism, it's freedom. How do you, what are you going to do, what, what are you going to do to, to, to put that to your advantage, to be served by freedom? 
Uh, and you think that if you that if you strike a blow against racism, you're that's already been done. It's, it's it's like so over. We did that. Does that mean every shred of, of racism is gone? Of course not. But on the other hand, you can do as a as a black person, you can do anything you want to do in America today. You you are you live in a shower of freedom. People from all over the world want to come here and get the freedom you have. And so you want to burn down Ferguson because you're afraid to move ahead. For more, sign up for Levin TV.